winter weather ahead of the season. It's so good to have everybody here this morning with us at 11. I'm going to make a couple of quick announcements, and we'll get the music started, and other folks can come trailing in here, though. I think it's, I haven't been out in the last three hours, but it's still raining out there. Still kind of misty, drizzly, exciting, maybe snow later. You know, not all of it unpredictable. It's all wonderful. So we're glad you're here in the warm room this morning. Uh, a couple of quick announcements, so pay attention, please. First of all, um, cold weather, it's perfectly appropriate. If you saw down the hall in the welcome area, the youth choir is selling cups of hot chocolate. So don't leave now. But afterwards, <laughs> afterwards, <laughs> I know some of you are going to get up and walk out and go get it and come back. And yeah, it's like whatever. Um, but uh, yeah, it, afterwards especially, on your way out, they'll be down the hall selling cups of coffee to help raise some funds for one of their um, choir trips coming up in the spring, I think. So, And they did a great job with us last week for those of you all who were here. That it's so good to have them with us. So go give them a little support and buy a cup of hot chocolate to uh, fuel your trip home. And then also um, next Sunday I had this announcement. This sounds really pretty intriguing if I'm all together by... 9.30 next week, I might have to even step in, but I hear in room 231 in the New Horizons class next Sunday at 9.30 will be an appearance of Elvis. Um, and they didn't, he didn't say impersonator, so I'm assuming it's maybe him. And, and he will be doing uh, spiritual and gospel music, so it should be a fun and inspiring uh, uh, Sunday school class hour. 9.30 at room 231, so if you want to get early and, and go see that and enjoy that, that'll be next Sunday. He'll prob he probably will do that, maybe do a little blue Christmas, or you never know what. <laughs> We're glad to have everyone here. Let's begin our worship service. <laughs>
it has a little bit to do with the idea of what we're trying to control. This lack of indecision, this, this lack of vision and this constant indecision and this desire to sort of control and yet not knowing what it is we're really trying to control, I think. Let's stand together as we bring our attention to this time together and to this space. I invite you to pray with me. Holy One, God, our creator, the source of all of our being, we give thanks for this weather and for the strangeness and the mystery and the seeming unpredictable nature in spite of our efforts to. We give thanks for the mysteries of the world and we give thanks for the mysteries of our own life. And for all of that, this opportunity to be present, to be mindful, to let go for just a little while and to be open. For this we give thanks. Amen. So it, it's all it's our offering song and it's our opening song. Bring your registration slip if you've signed to fill that out. If you have an offering, bring that forward. We're going to sing this uh, great uh, hymn, this great Pat Stevens tune. Morning has broken like the first morning. Blackbird has spoken like the first bird. A praise for the singing. A praise for the Creation of the new day. 
Take a moment and greet each other with signs of peace, would you please? y'all to sing this with us as well. time for good measure. been invited. I invite you to close your eyes, to just be. Take a moment just to feel the movement of your breath flowing in and flowing out. It is a miracle. 
and in this moment to sense the holy. We are so much more than our thoughts. We are so much more than what we do. And in this moment, we're invited to abide in that. We are so much more than the stories sometimes that we tell ourselves about ourselves. Sometimes these stories inflate our egos and limit us. But perhaps more often the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves diminish us. We seem small and unimportant. And we do not see or feel the spark of the divine that is within each of us. We know that we're never separate from the divine, the holy. And yet there is something that happens when we gather that uniquely focuses our awareness of what is good, what is sacred, and what is love. May the clarity of the sacred of deep trust and the holy sink into our hearts. In the name of the one in whom we live and move and have our being. Amen. Good morning. This is a reading from Luke 10, 25-37. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have rightly answered. Do this, and you will live. But the lawyer, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, Who is my neighbor? And Jesus said, A certain man went down to Jerusalem, went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and fell among thieves, who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed on by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him, bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and he set, on, he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii and gave it to the innkeeper and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And he said, he who showed mercy on him. And then Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. What if the highest destination of any human life was not a place that you could reach if you had to climb? When every above, above like hell, so no need to fly at all. What if to reach the highest place you had to fall? Like a trucker on your face, like a parachute jumping from a plane. Fall like an astronaut from space or an acrobat from making a mistake.
And what if all the sages Talking about the realms out of reach Wouldn't memorize the pages of gravity What if getting to the highest places like learning what you know I like going to where you are now Like coming home Like coming home Fall Like Adam falling down From the strange and earthly angels Whence he came Fall Find a way of trusting in the ground As if the highest and the lowest places Are the same They're the same What if the highest destination wasn't up above at all? What if to reach the highest place you had to fall? You had to fall. You had to fall. Listening to that song, and I'm suddenly realizing what an interesting image. Uh, this is the way my mind thinks associatively, freely associatively. And I started thinking about, well, the, uh, the beginning, the creation story. We often think of it theologically as the story of the fall, where, to be rather orthodox, where man fell away from God in the midst of creation. Why? Because of trying to control the world eating from the tree of knowledge. Interesting concept, and it just occurred to me, I wonder what it would be if we tried to fall intentionally. Just a thought. So my head goes in those places, and we are in the middle of this story, so be, be prepared. We might be going all over the place, because that's what tends to happen in the middle of our stories. We have a sense of beginning. We have a sense of how our stories begin. The great mythologist uh, Joseph Campbell, you know, like, any, like all of our writers who all agree with him, basically said that all myth, all narrative, all story falls in one form, that being the basic beginning, middle, and end. But the beginning, as I mentioned last week, is where the crisis happens. It's where the call happens. It's where that invitation happens, the person, the place, and the problem. And we spoke a little bit about sometimes that it seems like what may be the problem, in fact, is that we're looking at the world incorrectly. And with G.K. Chesterton, I sort of concluded with this idea that what's wrong with the world? Well, maybe I am. Maybe we are. Maybe it's a matter of how we see. Now, it's a lawyer in this story. You gotta think I'm gonna tell a lawyer joke, right? You'd be disappointed if I didn't. So I'll tell you one, you can stop me if you've heard it before. Thank you. So, a lawyer, a blonde, a rabbi, a priest, an Episcopalian, a Methodist, and a dog walk into a bar. <laughs> and the bartender says, what, this some kind of joke? Really? Where's the drum, John? Come on, I need the help. I need the support. All right, so I'll tell you one other one, and I hope I hadn't. I don't know if I've actually told this one or not, but this really fits well with this whole idea of what's, what the Samaritan story, I think, is really about. So a fellow walks into a bar, and he's a traveling salesman, and it's up in Duluth or somewhere like that, kind of remote, and he figures he can pretty well gauge the people in the community, and so he looks around this community, and he's talked to a few people in sales, and he wants to set himself up right, you know, be a part of the in-group. And so he looks around, and he says, every last Democrat is a horse's rear end. And then he looks around and smiles. He figures he knows where he is. Well, they pick him up. They beat him to a pulp and throw him out the door. 
He says, oh, my gosh, I guess, I'm, I guess I figured this place wrong, but now I know, he thought. So next day, he walks into the bar, looks around at all the people, smiles more confidently and says, every last Republican is a horse's rear end. Well, they grab him up and they throw him out the door, beat him to a pulp. And he's sitting out there dusting himself off later that afternoon, and finally someone walks out and he says, I don't understand. Who are you people? And he says, you don't know. This is horse country. How many of you been in that group? <laughs> so we're in the middle of this story. And this is a story where we sort of have to struggle with something. If we've actually seen it, we really have to struggle with it. We never really come to fullness. We never really come to wholeness. We never really come to the kingdom if we haven't struggled with the crises. So I want to explore with you a little bit about the story unfolding. And this idea of this Good Samaritan story bothers me on a couple of different levels. It, it confuses me, actually, because I've heard it many, many, many times, and many of you know the story of inward and outward and forward and backward. This lawyer goes, and he's trying to test Jesus. Now, here's the other thing, too. It's only in the Gospel of Luke. So there, is, there was some early debate whether or not Jesus even told this story, except for the one fact that it connects so nicely to the great commandment, which is recorded by him saying in all the Gospels. And so this one has merit as being his voice. It also has merit because there's been many times where Jesus has indeed spoken with Samaritans, uh, engaged in, in, uh, in, uh, in meals, in conversations, and healing of Samaritans. So this idea of the Samaritan being the subject of a parable fits very well with Jesus' technique of basically taking what you thought you knew and turning it upside down. And so a lawyer, someone who understands the law, asks him the, th the question, what is the one thing? You ever wondered that? You ever thought to yourself, I could just have the one thing that really kind of answers all the questions? If I could just have that one sense of what it is I need to do or what the problem is or how I need to address it. What's the one thing, the greatest commandment? And then Jesus says, you know what it is? And he says, well, yeah, I, I know. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Jesus adds the mind. That's not in the original uh, text in the Old Testament. And the other one is just like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's new. That's not in the Old Testament. That's Jesus' interpretation of the Old Testament law. So the lawyer then says, fine then, so tell me who my neighbor is. At which point Jesus basically turns reality upside down. Tells the story of the Good Samaritan. Now, every time I've heard this story and every time I've looked at this story, I've always thought to myself, this story is about doing good. This story is about helping those who are in need, those who are helpless, who are in the midst of problems or crises, reaching out to the poor, the hungry, the reality is that that's not what this story is about at all. A lot of folks go there. It's not. There's a lot of charitable organizations named after the Good Samaritan. In fact, that's wonderful. That's nice. There should be political organizations named after the Good Samaritan because it's not about charity. That's a backstory to it. That's part of the underlying reality to it. But the story itself is about shaking up what you think. And that part of it is what often doesn't get translated as clearly or as often. So Jesus tells the story that it's the Good Samaritan who finds this person along the side of the road between Jericho and Jerusalem. And, and a Levite goes by and a priest goes by and all the assumption, assumptive people that you would think would be the holy, the mighty, the ones in power, the ones who should evidence the law. And they pass on the other side for any number of reasons, which actually are not bad reasons. The guy's been beat up, he's bleeding, he's unclean. The law is very clear about that. The road itself, I've never been to Jerusalem, but if you've ever been to Jerusalem, my wife tells me she's been on a couple of trips over there, and she says that is still a really treacherous road. There's lots of twists and turns. There's lots of hiding places. There's lots of places like walking down a back alley or down an, an old building stairwell. You just don't really feel like you ought to go there by yourself. Makes perfect sense that any one of these folks would just as soon cross over, stay out in the open, not get 
uh, deal with the unclean person, not cross over with the, maybe they're heading toward temple, and then there they've got, they've already done their ritual purification. Any number of good reasons not to do it. That's not the point of the story. Then Jesus says it's a Samaritan. Now, I'm just going to spend a moment because I, I was trying to figure out the history of it myself, of this whole idea of why the Samaritans were so despised. But in, in the Jacob story with the 12 brothers, when, when he comes back and they are restored under him, the new kingdom is restored under Jacob, 10 of the 12 go to the northern kingdom. The other two go to the southern kingdom. The Samaritans were a part of the southern kingdom. There were great battles that happened between the two conflicts for power and struggle. Eventually, the Assyrians came and took over the northern, and I forget who came over and took the southern over, but then the, Samar the uh, folks who were in the southern uh, kingdom began to marry, intermarry, practice the multiple god worship, worshiping idols, any number of things that would really offend a traditional Jew. So that when the kingdom came back together years later, they were the last people that the Jews wanted to bring back into the kingdom. Because by now, they had already intermarried. They were now impure. They were now mixed, half-breeds, still questionable in their worship practices. But they still lived in the kingdom now, in the, national, the, the uh, nationality. So whenever you saw them, you had nothing to do with them. So Jesus says, guess who helps the guy on the side of the road? The lawyer says, then who's my neighbor? Jesus says, you tell me. He says, I guess it's the guy who showed mercy, the Samaritan. And Jesus says, go and do likewise. That's the only indication in terms of the idea of being charitable that comes out of that story. The rest of the story is all about shaking up what you just thought you knew about God's kingdom, about God's love, about God's grace, about who your friends are and who your friends aren't, who's your neighbor and who's not your neighbor. So then we come to this story in the middle of our series, and I thought to myself, well, okay, so that's a Samaritan. What's a neighbor? And immediately, you know what, thought, what I thought of. So I want you to join in with me. You ready? I didn't remember all of them, but here they are. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. Oh, beautiful day for a neighbor. You know this, right? Does anybody not know this? Please tell me. <laughs> okay, maybe, maybe some of the newer, young, younger children. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? Sing along with me. It's a neighborly day in the beauty wood. A neighborly day for a beauty. Turn to someone. Would you be mine? Turn again. Could you be mine? I have always wanted to get your pointing finger out to have a neighbor just like you. You, <laughs> I've always wanted to live in a neighborhood with you. Doesn't that feel strange to have someone point at you? Really? <laughs> so let's make the most of this beautiful day. Since we're together, we might as well say, Would you be mine? Could you be mine? Won't you be my neighbor? Now let's freak out the people online. Look at the camera. Won't you please? Please won't you be? Please, won't you be my neighbor? And he says, hi, neighbor. Yeah, where's the trolley? So that's what we teach our kids, right? Right? I mean, that's what we teach our kids is this whole idea of what it means to be a neighbor. And the reality is, is that it's a good idea. But you know what neighbor simply means? In the oldest form of neighbor, it simply meant a peasant. It simply meant a peasant farmer. And then it got eventually translated to mean the farmer next to you because there were farmers in a community. We're all farmers. We're all in a community. So who are your neighbors? Well, all of those folks. It wasn't necessarily what Jesus meant in that time and age because it hadn't been really interpreted that way, this idea that we have a neighborhood, this idea that we have neighbors who live next door or across the street from us. There's a lot of irony that goes into the backstories of the stories that we live out as people and as Christians. It's always interesting to me. And then you have these wonderful backstories, and I'm going to step on a few feet, I'm sure, maybe a few toes here, maybe uh, online perhaps. But um, isn't it always fun to see the classes that get named after Bibles, after Bible stories? So you have good neighbors as a class. 
Do you have koinonia as a class? Not just here. I mean, I, I've been in a number of churches. They're in all the churches. We have all these ch names. Um, charity, the, the charity class, the good word class. I mean, we have all these classes that are named after sort of these ideals. But the reality is, where is some of the best drama ever going to be experienced? In a Sunday school class? Anybody been there before? Nobody's willing to show their hands? <laughs> really, come on now. We've all known it. It's a, and the reason why it stands out like a sore thumb is because you're thinking this is the ideal of all places. Should it be happening here? And the reality is, well, yes, it should be because a lot of the problem is not who we ascribe to, the beliefs we assent to. It's how we see. And until we change the way we see things, a lot of times we're going to fall prey to what it means to be human. To what it means to want to control our world. Because that's who we are. That's a part of our nature. It's the one thing that, that we're motivated by, this, this idea of, of fear, this idea of of holding things together, this idea of how do I deal with insecurities, what am I supposed to be, all of, the, all of the great existential questions, we deal with them by trying to control the realities around them. But that, of course, is also our greatest falling, our greatest failing. There's this wonderful thing in our brain that I read about recently. Um, it's called the medial prefrontal cortex. You've studied up on this? Some of you have. It's the part of our brain that, given the right moment, responds with feelings of affection, of care, of empathy. It's a tiny little strip in the very middle of the prefrontal cortex, the medial, and it's that little strip that engages when we feel a part of a community or when we feel empathetic with someone. Now, the question is, and they've done research on this at Stanford and other places, but I was reading a study at Stanford in the social psych department, and what they've discovered is that it's not always clear which came first. Did the intention to engage come first, or did the prefrontal cortex engage hormonally or neurotransmittally and then open that person up? The research continues to suggest that given our natural tendency We'll always go with our in-groups and be clear on who the out-groups are. That we will go there naturally. So it will be easy for us to define who angers us, who frustrates us, who doesn't identify with us and whom we don't identify with in so many ways. It's easier to do that because apparently in order for it to engage, in order for that prefrontal cortex, that medial part to engage, we have to somehow invite it. We have to have a change of vision, a way of seeing things differently. Now, what, sometimes it happens because of crisis, right? So when 9-11 came, we saw all sorts of people from all over New York who probably had just insulted each other the day before, who may have kicked dust in somebody's face, who may have splashed water on somebody, who may have cursed somebody behind the counter. Everybody came out of the woodwork, all of them compassionately engaged together. Sometimes a crisis will engage our sympathy and our empathy. Empathy is a gutter, a, a deeper, more guttural reaction. Empathy is what typically engages that part of the brain because it's this sense of, we talked about mirror neurons last, last week. It's that sense of us that we can identify in someone else, we can see in ourself. And that allows us to immediately respond in that capacity. But it's not natural. It's not our most, it's not our most typical place where we will go. So I want to suggest a couple of quick points just with this, with, my, with where we are at Act 2. Just three points. And I'm not usually a three-point person, but I did this today because I think it helps me figure out exactly what I'm trying to say. Maybe it'll help you understand it as, first, uh, as well. The first thing is this. I've got to get to number one here. 
We call it the Good Samaritan story. There is absolutely nothing good about it. Do you understand what I'm saying? There is absolutely, ultimately, nothing good about it. In fact, Jesus doesn't call him a good Samaritan. He doesn't call the Levite or the priest a bad guy either. He simply says, who's your neighbor? Well, here are these three people. You tell me which one's the neighbor. The neighbor is a value judgment, which is all right because that's who we are. We make values about who we want to accept and who we don't. I would love to have somebody who cares for me. I would much rather have somebody who shows me mercy and compassion. Who's the neighbor? The one who showed compassion because that's where I would like to be. That's what I would like to have. The other two offend me. Now, Augustine and Origen, well, Origen first and then Augustine later. Origen was a philosopher, Jewish philosopher and theologian in the third century. He's the first person to say good. Do you know who was the good Samaritan? It was Jesus. It wasn't the story of the Samaritan. Jesus was called the good Samaritan because he had been crucified. He was the one nobody liked, and then he became the good Samaritan. He was identified. It was years and years and centuries later when the Samaritan was given the name Good Samaritan. The only reason I raise that is because, again, I think we have to question how we see. We are so ready to ascribe certain things, to adapt certain ideas, to anchor them to certain beliefs, that we don't give it a second thought and we don't see the bigger picture. Just as a quick example, we might not realize the time we cut somebody off in the freeway because we were in a hurry or because we felt we were more justified given whatever circumstance. But when that same experience happens to us later on, we are completely ready to make judgment without even remembering or thinking about our own actions. We contradict ourselves all the time. It's hard for us to see the big picture because we're not trained that way. We're trained more in-group, out-group control and what we can't control. First point, there's nothing particularly good or bad about the Samaritan. Hang on to that. Just hold on to it because it's weird sounding. But just hold it. The second point that I want to talk about is who is our neighbor? And I mentioned the in-group and out-group. I think our neighbors are who we choose, not who are chosen for us. I think the Good Samaritan story tells us our neighbors are who we choose by our actions. And in terms of the kingdom, or as we've said in here before, the kingdom of God, in Jesus' definition, our neighbors include everybody. Our neighbors are everyone, and it requires a different way of seeing. If you're a Republican, your neighbors are the Democrats. Feeling your blood boil? If you're a Democrat, your neighbors are those short-sighted Republicans who have as much vision as you do, perhaps, and you've never been able to see it. If you're wealthy, your neighbor may be that person who just annoys the heck out of you on the street. Your neighbor is whoever it is that you find yourself anxious against, anxious about. Now, Carl Jung, and I, I'm going to say this because I'm a psychology major. That was my background, and I did counseling for years. But Carl Jung always said that the one thing that we can learn in the process of individuation and the process of becoming whole and what I like to think of in terms of is in the process of our faith maturing, the one thing he said that's a huge tool toward that development is to 
start to ask yourself, what is it about that person I don't like that's saying something about me? He called it the shadow. The prefrontal cortex would remind us that it's a part of our nature. We're going to stand off from things because of our desire to control, to be a part of in-groups, but the reality is, is we got so much in common. If I would just stop to see what it is that I'm not liking about it or it makes me uncomfortable about it, I'm probably going to learn a lot about me. So point two, who is our neighbor? Our neighbor is who we begin to choose to see. Everyone. And then the last point that I want to make, point number three. Let me get here, right here. Well, there it is. The hardest thing for us to do, and I will be right there with everyone else recognizing this, the hardest thing for us to do is to let go of this idea that we know better. I've told the story of the rabbi who often said life is like a river, and when all the disciples questioned him before his last dying breath, he said, so who knows then? Maybe it's not. <laughs> it's told of the founder of the Hasidic faith that he told that story. And I would venture to guess that even most of the Orthodox Jews, part of the Hasidic faith, have a hard time remembering that particular narrative. Who knows? But that's the hardest part for us, I think, sometimes, is letting go on purpose and just being present. To me, it's the middle of the story. It's where we find ourselves today. When we recognize we are accepted, we are loved by God, we are part of this amazing creation, it's a part of us, we are set with a very distinctive challenge that the lawyer unwittingly stepped into. And that is, all of these people are your neighbor. Start seeing it differently and go and do likewise. Just to hint ahead for next week, in the great classic idea of how stories develop in all of the movies you've loved to watch and all the books you've loved to read and all the stories you've loved to hear, what always makes a story a strong, positive, even if it's a tragic story, a powerful, engaging experience that you don't ever forget is that something changed. Something had to change in that character. And when it did change, when they did learn to see something, or if a tragedy never learned to see it, when they did, what happens but that they come back to the community, having lived now in both worlds, and now seeing the kingdom, and reflecting, and trying to help others see. And it's a daily, moment-to-moment -moment grind. The good news is, when we see it, when we recognize that's our call, God hasn't gone anywhere. Amen. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love Where there is injury, pardon Where there is doubt, faith Where there is despair, hope Where there is darkness, light And when there is sadness, joy Oh, divine master, grant that I may Not so much to see, to be consoled As to console 
uh, to be understood as to understand uh, to be loved as to love for it is in giving that we receive It is in pardoning that we are pardoned And it's in dying that we are born To eternal life I invite you all to stand with me as we have our final song together, Anamkara, Soul Friend. And just to remind you, of course, uh, uh, our good friend um, um, Howard Hanger wrote this wonderful song, and he often told us when we were, uh, Brad and I've been up there before too, he's often said, we always think of Soul Friend as our neighbor. <laughs> um, it's, soul Friend is our reality. Soul Friend is God in our midst. It's literally recognizing soul present with us always. And when we do that, it really does transform the reality around us. So maybe we can sing with that in mind. And I want to just make an announcement, too, that Antonio Hernandez joined our, our church, but he joined uh, through Disciples Church this morning, but he's a new member of our, of our church at First Methodist. I invite you to come and say hello to him afterwards. And... And um, we're glad to have Ann back because she was in the hospital this week and she was dealing with some heart valve stuff, but she's back and some more journey before all of that. Um, that so we want to keep her in our prayers. If you are interested in joining this congregation, come forward while we're singing. Let's sing together on Amkara. <laughs> Here we go. In the midst of the morning, we open. All of the gifts of the day, we open our hearts to take it all in and give it all back in our way. Let us sing of the beauty around us, let us sing of the beauty within. Oh, hear the earth tell that all shall be well. Anamkara, Anamkara, so friend. We're part of it all in our sorrow. We're part of it all in our bliss. We're part of the sun and part of the rain. We're all part of God's holy king. Let us sing of the beauty around us. Let us sing of the beauty within. Oh, hear the earth tell that all shall be well. Anamkara, Anamkara, so friend. Let's have a blessing together, and, and just as a reminder, I'll invite you to come back next week. I'll, we also have a special guest singer, uh, which I won't say much more about that, but, um, and also something very unusual, we will have, um, we're going to resurrect, and maybe it will be a continuation, but we're going to resurrect an 1111 um, spiritual improvisational group. <laughs> right now, there's only two of us, but... Um, <laughs> Next week, come on back, and we have some, I'm going to have some fun for you to think about uh, in terms of how we might move forward in this world uh, that we call God's being and um, inviting us to participate in. But for now, let's pray and have a blessing together. Holy One, we pray that we might be instruments of your peace, that as we move about in the world, as hard as it can be sometimes, that we might just let go, that we might take the first anger, the, mer the first anxiety, the first doubt, Take a deep breath and just let it go, let it out. That we might be open to seeing where, in fact, 
We are one another's neighbors. In spite of our differences, we have much more in common than we realize. That we might be bonds for your peace, for your love, and for your hope. Bless us from this place. Amen. It's David's birthday tomorrow uh, also, people. He turns 21. I know you want to say hi to him. Feliz Navidad. Feliz cumpleaños. Freedom. Yeah. 